Roads to Leningrad, Roads to Moscow. Two games designed by Vance von Boris through GMT Games, separated roughly by nine years. It's an excellent system. Um, I actually ordered, or actually bought Roads to Moscow uh, last year, and uh, I've been playing more war games, and I popped that one on the table, and it was definitely the most complex one I had played up to that time, and it took me a little bit to get into and to figure out, but it was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed I guess, uh, as many wargamers say, the narrative appeal of the game, because I played Solitaire, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And so a couple months ago, I was able to pick up Roads to Leningrad, the older version, a nice unpunched copy, um, and that was a nice little treat. Uh, so I think, because I enjoyed the game so much, and not a lot has actually talked about the road system, uh, Vance von Boris also designed um, the East Front series for GMT. That's sort of their more monster epic East Front series, as it sounds, campaign, uh, which is more detailed, uh, uses like half-inch counters, um, has very detailed battle orders and um, procedures for how to get combat done and supply and stuff. These games are a little simpler. They're definitely not as heavy as like the East Front series at all, but they share a lot of similarities in terms of uh, movement and the types of counters that are uh, used, although it's not divisional scale, it's more battalions and companies. But uh, it's nice. It's a one-map game, which is nice. I don't have a lot of space on my table to put down more than one or two maps, so one-map games are very nice. Uh, the counter density can be fairly light to a lot of units on the board, but it's never that overwhelming. I never feel like I'm getting lost, or if I walk away from the table, I don't remember what happened. So in a lot of ways, it's a very good solitaire game. It's chit-pull, um, so it's alternating turns, but chit-pull, so you never know which... Um, uh, what units are going to activate when, even though you know whose turn it's going to be. So it's not quite like um, other chit pull games where maybe you put all the chits in one cup and you draw out of it. There are two cups, one for German and Soviet forces. And uh, so it gives a lot of variability there, and there's a lot of tension there, uh, which I really enjoy, obviously, playing Solitaire. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, actually, we're going to actually do a battle through the Roads of Leningrad series, uh, because mainly I just got it, and I enjoyed it, and I just played through the Battle of Solzy. And that was actually a very fun battle. Um, so I think we're going to do that one again because I'm a little familiar with how it, it goes and, and sort of the, the arrival of reinforcements and the, the pace and the flow you should be trying to get. Uh, my last game was a narrow German victory, mostly because I had made some big-time mistakes to the Soviets in the end game, And hopefully I can correct that. Maybe we'll see a little different this time, but it was a lot of fun. And so I think we'll start with that one. Uh, and if the series goes well, I would love to do another another version, another video series on something for Roads to Moscow, because obviously I played that one first and I really enjoy it. And I think there are lots of differences there, subtle differences and some bigger ones that I really enjoy, but the series as a whole is very good and I like it. Uh, one note I will say is that I will be playing the Roads to Leningrad game using the Roads to Moscow rules because these games were nine years apart. And uh, so they did some refining on the system as a whole. Uh, the air combat's a lot different. And uh, you can actually, they had on the you know forums, the designer said, you know, yes, you can play Roads to Leningrad with the Roads to Moscow mules. They thought they would be pretty compatible. Uh, I did play most recent playing of Salt Sea with the Roads to Moscow rules, and it played fine. I didn't have an issue with it. Um, so we'll talk about a little of the differences there and uh, get it on the table and actually talk a little bit about movement of units and how the game works a little bit. I won't do a huge rules breakdown, but I'll talk about what makes this game interesting, at least in the scope of what the game covers. And uh, then we'll start, you know, breaking it down turn by turn. So I figured before we begin, I would show you a little bit of the map of the Battle of Solzy before the units get put on. And this is it in wide angle. Sorry, I got a little brightness coming in there. So that's it. You can basically see that like a diagonal road runs through the map. And this is the main road, and this is where most of the action will take place. And in fact, the goal, one of many goals the Germans have, is to take the town of Solzy. And then, of course, their ideal situation is to move up to Shimsk, but also to take things in the south, secure their flanks down here. What actually happens is, is that generally the Germans who start down around here, their first goal is the town of Sydney, which is located there. What will happen is they'll generally push up this road 
and find light resistance, pretty easy to take. But as they get closer and closer and closer to Solzy, the Soviet forces, which will at first be put on a back foot because they weren't expecting the German attack at this time, will eventually start getting their act together and they'll reinforce along a couple of broad fronts. They'll come in kind of from, well, let's see, oop, there we go, from up here around Shimsk. There will be a already large contingent of Soviet forces up there. They will begin pushing down this road. There will also be another division, or not division, but a grouping of Soviet, or Soviet forces that come from the north, and they will bring pressure down here. As well as two kind of weakened groups will approach from the south. They'll come up this road, and they can actually threaten to cut the uh, supply road here by coming up the back and intersecting the road there. Because as you can see, the German supply points are pretty much here at uh, Borovici. Uh, there's also a minor one here, which isn't listed, but it sort of connects there. And the other main one is up here next to Zvad. One of the things about the road series is supply. Of course, supply was a big deal on the Eastern Front, and for this game, it's no different. The main thing is that supply comes from those supply points I just pointed out, and they travel pretty much for free along this main road. Uh, the minor gray roads also count, but the main road is where it comes from. Units can be up to seven hexes away from this main road and still be in supply as long as the supply route they trace back to main road uh, doesn't do things like cut across a stream with no bridge. And as you can see, the streams, there are a lot of streams. And so this is one of the main things that blocks supply as you're moving across the map. Uh, if there's a bridge, of course, you can go across it. But that's one of the big things there. And um, infantry units can use trails. They can act, these can act like supply roads for them. So they actually, they get a lot more freedom of movement, unless it's a, uh, well, actually during rain, they still count it. But um, so infantry, while being sort of weak offensively in a sense that they're slow, uh, I mean, they're pretty powerful, they can be when grouped, but they're slow because they only have, you know, so much movement and it's leg movement. But they can utilize these trails much more effectively, and they can also walk through forests much easier uh, than motorized or mechanized units. So you can be surprised how quickly, especially on trails, that infantry units can uh, snake down the map on and start, you know, causing havoc and whatnot. So essentially what will happen is the Germans will motor their way up here, and by the time they get to Solzy, which will be fairly defended if you're smart as a Soviet player and think ahead, um, what will happen is these forces that are coming in from up here, and then from up here, and then also from down here, will sort of create this uh, pressuring pocket effect. And if you're not careful, you can find yourself out of supply very quickly as the German player. In which case you'll probably do a retreat, a fighting retreat, and ultimately what you hope to do is essentially gain the ground you take in the beginning, which is Sydney. And if you're very good, then you can push your way back up to Solzy and retake it. If you can manage to hold on to that or retake Solzy at the end, you most likely will win. If you only get pushed back to Sydney, but you manage to also hold some of your northern uh, routes like uh, Gordishie, then you will also have victory, assuming that you also eliminate a fair amount of HQs and armored units, which is how the uh, German player accrues victory points. They take locations, or they destroy Soviet HQs or artilleries, their uh, artillery units, their work points. Okay, so that's sort of a basic overview of the map. Next, I'll put on some forces, and we'll start outlining um, potential avenues of attack. So I know I said I was going to make the next video sort of the outline of the attacks or, or the lines of attack we were going to use. We're going to set up the board and sort of go over the first uh, thoughts of attacking and defending for this scenario. But I thought it would be better if we stopped a minute and looked at the counters themselves and sort of described some of the movement functions we'll be seeing because movement, of course, is very big in this game. Uh, one of the best ways to destroy your opponent is to outmaneuver them and to cut off their supply. That's a fairly basic concept in war games, but in this one, uh, that's especially true because sometimes some units become so difficult to assault that you literally need to cut them off in order to even have a, a fighting chance to knock them out of position or to just put the pressure on your opponent to force them to react and to either, you know, break out of a bad situation or set up a new defensive line. Uh, even the threat of even a small unit cutting off supply can have large consequences. And so movement is, is actually a very big part of this game. Um, a lot of thought goes into where do you put your units, um, what's a good defensive line to hold for them, where's a good place I can put them so that next turn maybe they can have a favorable uh, position to attack from or defend or hold. You're thinking a lot ahead, of course.
wars, and that's what any good war game should do, and this one does it in spades. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between Soviet and German units at the top here. As you'll see, I have a row of German units, and of course I have the ubiquitous uh, wargaming tweezers used by anybody that films war games, it seems, anymore today. So I have those. They actually do are very awesome and work really well, as you can see. So I'll be using those. Uh, and what you can tell here is that we have our standard sort of uh, attack, uh, defense, movement here on the counters. They also have other numbers like its uh, stacking rating and its efficiency rating. Um, what the biggest thing to notice, of course, with movement is there's three different types in this game. There is sort of this red box movement like here. There is this orange circle movement there. And then we sort of have plain black movement here. And what does that mean? Well, essentially, black leg movement well, that's just what it is. It's leg movement. This is infantry. As you can see here, this is actually a uh, sort of a broken up, uh, was, that a, was it a company? Um, no, battalion. It's two battalions sort of put together to form like one battalion, two broken up ones. And so that's why you see the sort of double notation there. But it has a stacking value of three. Its, it's efficiency rating is five. You know, it's pretty average. It's not great. It has an attack of five, defense of three, movement of four. And because it's black, you know, it's an infantry unit. That means it has leg movement. Um, here's just a plain old infantry unit that's just, you know, full strength, 444. A little little less uh, uh, efficient there. It's only got a 4 rating, but of course same stacking rating as 3. I don't think there's any unit in this game with a stacking rating higher than 3. Um, and this game in particular has stacking rating units, or units that have a stacking rating of 0, which is not included. Well, I guess headquarters have always been 0. But there's actually like attacking units that uh, have the zero value, which gives some stacks added punch. And we'll talk about that more when the scenario actually is put on the board and we see what kind of forces we're playing with. Uh, if you look up here, the red box movement means that it is um, motorized, mechanized. It generally is independently capable of moving around. You can tell this is sort of a motorized infantry. It's got the two little wheels there on the infantry symbol. As you can tell, these guys are just moving on plain old legs. they got no wheels. As you can see here, the 6 is bigger than 4. That's one of the big differences between motorized uh, and just infantry, like infantry units, is that they generally, of course, have more movement. But one of the other bonuses that the red box movement gives is that they don't get stuck in zones of control. If you hit an enemy zone of control and you're using a unit that has leg movement, or what we'll describe as also motorized, but what they call orange circle motorized, if you run into an enemy zone of control, you are stuck. It's a sticky zone of control. You can't move. It's over. Red box units, um, however, can use uh, can pay an additional movement cost to exit a zone of control. So they can kind of power through, provided they still have movement to do so. Um, and that becomes a really handy ability. And that's pretty much what differentiates the German forces and the Soviet forces. A, a good part of the German forces are red box movement units. So they're able to quickly move to the front. They're able to quickly move around other units that are stopping them and take advantage of better positioning or flanking maneuvers. Um, Whereas most of the Soviet units are just leg, um, the HQs generally are, are red box units, but mostly you're dealing with leg movement or, the, or a lot of the occasional um, sort of orange circle. And I guess I should talk about orange circle movements since I've talked about the extremes of both leg and, and sort of red box. Orange circle, as you can see, is generally more, five is better than four, of course. And the only disadvantage of orange circle units, one of the big ones, of course, is that they get stuck in enemy zones of control and they have to pay motorized costs on the train effects chart. So if they move into a forest, for example, it costs two to move in here if it's not raining. If it's raining, it costs, I think, three to move into a forest with a clear hex there. So they, take, they, they pay more to move in a sense that they, they take those sort of uh, penalties and they get stuck in zones of control. But you know, the trade-off is they can move a little bit further and faster. And generally, you're gonna see orange circle units be things like the uh, was this an anti-tank unit, uh, artillery? There's also anti-air units. They don't really give you bonuses on air combat or anything. From what I understand, anti-tank and anti-air units. In this game, they just sort of, sort of serve as defensive filler. You put them usually with your artillery, I found, or you fill in frontline units when they start dying and you need added uh, defensive bonus or you need to guard certain points. Uh, but for the most part in this game, in the Roads to Leningrad series, that's, that's mainly what they serve. In the Roads to Moscow series, a lot more of them have um, a red value, which I want to discuss. They have red uh, attack or defense values here. And what that means is, is that sometimes on the combat results table, you will roll for an attack, and what you'll get is a red-coded answer. And what that means is armor attrition. And armor attrition says that if an attacking or defending force 
has a unit with red numbers on it, if it's attacking and you have a red numbered unit, then the first loss of the defender must be an armored unit if they can do that. And vice versa for defense. If an attacking force is attacking someone and they have defenders with a red value, which I don't have here, then the attacking force, if it takes a loss, it must lose an armored step uh, to satisfy that requirement. Um, the armor attrition rule also takes an effect with airplanes. So if you've used airplanes in combat, which we'll discuss, you roll to see if they actually uh, survive that mission or not. Um, and it also affects leaders. If you use a leader in a battle uh, and you get an armor attrition result, you have to roll to see if the leader survives. So it's a neat mechanic that sort of simulates the fact that some guns were very powerful and could wear away even a superior attacking force just through the fact that, you know, attacking a well-defended position or someone with very powerful guns can obviously blunt uh, your spearhead. And even the units you, you want to die, they just don't die first. Your armor dies instead. Um, we'll discuss a little bit more of that when I go into how combat works. That'll become more clear. But so that's a little bit of an explanation of what the units look like. Um, and I guess that's where I talk about the movement. And of course, the big difference, I've already said it before, I'm going to summarize it again. German forces tend to be more mechanized, motorized, faster moving. Soviet units tend to be more plentiful, but their leg movement and they're often this infantry. So as you can see, they can pretty much only get three units in a hex with a stacking value of three because you can only have a total stacking value of nine in a hex. So we can see up here that, yeah, the German infantry is also a three, but their armor units are a one. And this gives them a huge advantage because armor has a lot of strength relative to its stacking size, which, you know, makes sense considering that armor is a pretty powerful force on the battlefield. Uh, and this is the primary advantage you'll see with the Germans. They have more armor, faster units, um, less of them, but they're stronger and uh, tend to can, do, can, can do great damage quickly. And the other big advantage, of course, is that as being a chip pull game, the Germans enjoy the advantage of having better organization, better command, so they get usually two chits for each formation they run. So when you play with the 8th Panzer, there's two activation chits. They move twice in a turn. Whereas the Soviet forces tend to be less organized, you know, a little bit more plotting, and so you only get one activation chit. So like here, there's the 180th. You only get one chit to activate them. Uh, in a turn. The Soviets do get access to an activate any chip marker and that can be very helpful for the Soviets but it still is not as powerful as, as, as what the Germans get to roll with with having two activation chits. And you'll see more of that as the combat unfolds and we talk more about uh, how the game actually works. So continuing with a little bit of introductory rules and sort of how the counters work, I thought we would do a little sample battle here and show sort of how the different combat tables work, as well as the choices you'll be making when you draw a chit and deciding on the two different types of phases you wanna have, either a mobile or assault uh, combat phase. Um, actually, I say phase, it could be a segment. I'll look up the official terminology, but I think you'll understand what I'm saying. So what I've set up here is sort of an imaginary battle or imaginary confrontation between the 8th Panzer here and the 70th Order of Lenin Rifle Division over there. As we can see, the Lenin Rifle Division is currently sitting on top of the town of uh, Dolzhitsy. Dolzhitsy? Dolzhitsy? There we go. Um, and as a stack, you can see that they have this sort of a tank on top, they have an engineering unit, and they also have um, an infantry unit as well. Uh, actually, two battalions, an engineer battalion, a battalion of infantry, and a company of tanks here. Together, the defensive total is 5 plus 3 plus 1. That equals, what, uh, 9? So you have 9 defensive factors holding that position. As the attacking Germans, I draw the 8th Panzer chit, and I decide, well, it's time to move up the road. We're going to have to dislodge these, um, these Soviet troops here, and I think we can do that with the forces I have available. As you can see, my stack also includes some armor, but it includes more of it and better quality. So we have... Sort of that one. And these are all companies. So we have here a combined total of nine attack points, as you can see, three, six, nine. Underneath it, we have infantry coming with it, um, mechanized infantry, or motorized infantry, I should say. And uh, as you can see here, six, seven, six, we have two of those. We have two battalions of them coming, and they're very powerful infantry units. So combined attack that we have, just raw attack power in the stack, which as you can see also equals nine, right? So we have three, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, the total attack power we have here is 21. Yeah, 12 plus nine, 21, okay. And 
And they're all also red box movement, which I think you know. So I think they all have a value of six. Yeah, so, so you know, we won't be using all six movement points, but that goes to show that we could pull off a lot of maneuvers here. So let's say we drew the chit and we got the eighth panzer. The first thing you have to decide to do when you draw a chit is if you're gonna do a mobile um, attack phase or if you're gonna do a assault attack phase. If you do a mobile attack phase, you get to use your full movement allowance, but at the cost of uh, some Ne uh, some negative, or I guess actually it's positive, but it's actually a negative uh, die roll modifier when you're trying to make uh, battle checks, coordination checks, uh, bringing in close air support, or using artillery. Anytime you use a mobile sequence, you're going to face increased odds of making these kind of checks. For the Germans, you know, that's less of a problem because they generally have higher efficiency rating units. Their units generally tend to be a lot more quality, so you can do mobile more often and not worry about it. For the Soviets, uh, in the few times you maybe want to use a mobile counterattack, um, this can be more of a detriment. Your units usually are less quality, it's harder to pass those checks, and if you don't pass these checks, you incur uh, greater negative modifiers to the eventual battle rule, which we'll discuss here in this combat example. So if I've drawn the 8th Panzer chit, oh, I should say, that's the mobile one. If you choose to do Assault, then what you do is you have half your MA. So if we did an assault, then all these six uh, motorized units would actually be, actually, well, three. Um, the bonus to doing assault is that while you have only half movement, you can construct strong points. You can begin constructing them. If you do another assault turn later, I believe you finish that strong point. So it is possible for the Germans to construct a strong point in a turn. I guess if you have the activate any formation marker for the Soviets, the same thing could be said for them. But it is a clever way to introduce the building of strong points, which uh, is a great way to slow down your opponent if you actually get it built. Um, it's a good way to introduce it without being overpowering, because in assault, it you know you can only use half your movement, and if you're the Germans, uh, half your movement is kind of a not always a great choice. This game really is pushing the Germans to move down the road to keep the movement going, to keep the tempo high. And while assaults are very helpful, in another way I'll discuss, uh, that half movement is it can be quite a bummer, and it can really uh, restrict how fast and how far you can go. The one big advantage of an assault is you don't have this sort of die roll modifiers hanging over your head when you do things, because assaults are generally thought to be more planned out, and thus uh, you run into less sort of logistical problems, coordination problems. And because of that, and because they're well, more well thought out, you can utilize um, units outside the formation you're activating to aid an attack. And what that means is, I don't have that set up here, but let's say, well, let's go ahead and pull some out, I guess, since we're sitting here. Normally when you draw a chit, you can only attack with uh, the units of that formation you've drawn, unless you use an assault uh, option. And let's say like for something, like let's say I set up here and we had this um, unit from the third motorized, and it was already sitting there. If I did a mobile attack with the eighth panzer when I drew it, you know, I could move my troops up there an attack, but I can't utilize the third motorized to help me out because only when you do mobile attacks, you can only use that uh, the units of the formation you pulled. If I did an assault, let's say my units are already up here and I drew the eighth panzer and I decide, well, I'm going to do an assault attack. Well, when I decide to assault this uh, this position held by the 70th, um, I can utilize the third motorized as well to help me in that attack. Um, that can be very helpful, especially when you're coming up on Soviet strong points or focuses of defense. As a German player, you're going, to, you're going to want to wrap around those points with as many powerful units as you can and just really use assaults to pound them out. Because even though uh, mobile combat is often desired, if the unit is in a strong point, you have to use assault. If the unit's in a town, such as Solzy, the big towns, or Shimsk, uh, you have to use an assault. So in many ways, you, cannot, you can't just do the entire game with mobile combat. That would be great. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, Many times you have to use assault, and so relying on kind of surrounding your units, using them to surround key points, and just using your activations to do combined assaults, it really does bring a lot of strength to bear, and it can be very detrimental to fixed fortification lines. So that's why you would choose to do an assault, not only to build strong points, but also to utilize other units that may be very helpful with their combat. So we'll go ahead and reset what we had here. So we'll just pretend I drew the 8th Panzer chip. So I'm going to use mobile combat. Um, I could do assault. Uh, if you choose to do assault, then you can only do assault type combats. If you choose a mobile um, segment, then you can use mobile attacks or assault attacks. You're not limited. Um, so that's one kind of minor difference. And that'll come to play as, as we have examples in the game. That'll become more obvious how that works. So let's say I drew this. Uh, and actually what we'll do is we'll, 
we'll just push him back a little bit. So, because normally you could do assault here, and that'd be great. It'd be like, actually like, I wouldn't get those modifiers if I was only going to try to attack this. That'd be pretty easy. Let's say I was back here or whatever. I'm going to use a mobile attack. I'm just going to demonstrate that. So I got six movement points here. Roads cost one half a movement point in rain or shine. That's the one thing about this game. You have rain turns, you can have cloudy turns that don't affect movement but affect air combat, or you can have clear turns. Uh, rain turns really slow down movement, and the only terrain type that is not affected by a rain turn is this main road. So main roads cost one half point movement for every unit that uses it. So I have this stack here. So we have six, so I got and one and that would be two, but because I'm entering the zone of control of another unit, you have to add one movement. So that normally would be two movement points to go here, but actually it's three because I entered the zone of control of a unit. And actually, the, this unit on top does not exert a zone of control. I wonder if that's a misprint, because this is a tank. Hmm. Regardless, the infantry does exert a zone of control, so that's not actually a big deal. And as I discussed earlier in movement, I could decide to power around these guys. So this cost me three movement, but I could expend three more movement by going into the forest here because that costs me two as a, as a mechanized unit, but also one more for entering the zone of control of a unit. So that's three more movement to go there. So it was three movement to go here, three more movement to go there. And for example, I couldn't go here because that would be four movement, one extra for crossing that stream. Streams are kind of a big deal in this game. Um, if it's rain, they're just almost impossible to cross. But anyway, so I approach this unit. I'm also going to bring along my artillery. Let's kind of keep him at a safe distance. We'll put him here. And the reason I can kind of keep him back is that I didn't discuss this with the other units, but artillery have ranges, and that's that little number up here. And this one is five. So it's five. It can fire on hexes five, or it can fire on, yeah, five hexes away, essentially. One, two, three, four, five. So it's just five away. We'll keep it there. What I do is then I sit there, I move my units, and then I say, okay, I'm going to declare an attack. Now, because I'm carrying armor with me, in addition to infantry, I can do a mobile attack. Um, armored cars also allow mobile attack, but almost anything with a silhouette, I believe, allows mobile attack. And what that does is it just gets you a more favorable um, CRT to use, and it's uh, generally less bloody, but it, it pushes units around more, and that can give you a lot of breathing room and space. And if you're smart and you can surround a unit with zones of control, you can even inflict some losses. And we'll discuss that in just a second, too. So I sit down, I put down my marker. I'm like, OK, going to do a mobile attack. You know, we'll put this here. If you were doing big battles, it helps the market. We'll just do that there. So we combine the attack value versus defense value. And this is where I find having plexi and having marker um, is actually very helpful. So what do we say? We had 21 attack. What was that, to 9, I believe? So the rounding in this game is not generous. I know I was reading the OCS rules, and it's very generous in terms of the rounding and getting odds. There is no very generous rounding here. You round down. So t 9 and 21 is just 2 to 1 odds. These aren't great, but say for mobile combat, it's not bad at all. So actually, I've kind of calculated odds, but there are a couple steps you do before that. So let's say I declare attack. I'm like, OK, I'm attacking the Soviet uh, 70th right there with mobile attack. Here are the options you can have as a defending unit if you're attacked. You can combat refuse, which only can occur if all of your units in the stack have red box movement. These do not, so it can't do that. But if it did, you would try to roll and pass your efficiency rating. You have to roll that number or less. Uh, if you roll that, then you can move, I believe, what is it, half your movement? Let me take a look. you retreat two hexes. So you get to retreat two hexes, the attacker can move two hexes, but you basically have to avoid combat that turn. Uh, since they're not all red box, I can't do that. Um, you can also um, declare reaction movement if I had another unit that was within two hexes and had red box movement. So if this guy was up there and the stack was attacked, I could say, okay, I'm going to try to react move this guy. And you have to roll and do an efficiency check. So you have to be five or less with I don't believe there's any modifiers, you just have to beat that. If you roll a 5 or less, then you can move up to half his MA, so he can go and 1 and a half, because it's 1 to enter the hex of zone of control, so it's, you know, and 1, 2, I guess. So that's 2 movement. Um, and that's called reaction movement, but only red box units can do it. So you're seeing that red box units have lots of advantages. They're able to react move, they can refuse combat. Those are some of the many advantages they hold. The last thing you can do, or possibly do as a defender, is declare no retreat. 
Um, but in order to do that, you have to have certain specifications or you have to have certain qualifications, kind of like the other ones. Um, the main thing is you have to have at least three steps of strength in that hex in your stack there. Um, you can't have failed combat refusal, so you can't do combat refusal, fail it, and then say, oh, I'm not going to retreat, because you basically did just try to retreat. You also either have to have a friendly strong point or fortified line effects. Um, fortified lines are actually printed on the hex, there are none on this map. Strong points are things you can build. There, are no, there isn't one there, so he doesn't get that. Or if we have the formation HQ or leader. Um, I don't have the HQ out here, but if their HQ was there, he could declare no retreat. And essentially what that does is it just adds another modifier that um, to my opponent's attack. They're actually going to suffer like sort of a negative modifier. Uh, the consequence is if I suffer any sort of retreat results, I have to lose steps instead of retreating. But that can be very handy sometimes. Sometimes you don't want to give up ground and you'd rather trade units for space. Um, sometimes you always hear the Soviets are trading space, you know, for time or whatever. But here sometimes you're like, no, I need to hold this city. I need to hold this point. So you're willing to take the no retreat. And it can be a big pain if the unit has a strong point, has some terrain bonus, and also has no retreat. As we see here, they will have a terrain bonus because they're actually on top of a village here. So they get already a bonus there. So a unit that has a strong point, no retreat, and terrain bonus can get up to a plus three modifier on the roll, which we'll see that higher numbers are bad in this game when you roll. So uh, plus modifiers are bad for combat. Anyway, so what we see in this attack... We can't do a combat retreat. We have no units to react move to. Um, technically, I guess this unit, this tank, could react move away. You can say, okay, I'm going to react, and this guy's going to run away. If you think he's going to die, or you want to save him or something, take the cowardly way out. Um, you could do that, but we're not going to. And they can't declare no retreat. Okay, so we've, we've done the sort of pre-attack routine there. Now we go through to the next steps. It's a mobile attack because we're not attacking a strong point. We're not attacking a town. Um, there's what other ones can we say? That's pretty much it. And we're not attacking up a slope. Yeah, there's a few terrains that prohibit it, but it's pretty limited. So we satisfied all that, and we have an armored unit, so we can do a mobile attack. We do two to one odds, and then you kind of go through some steps here. First thing is, do you want to bring in close air support? Uh, you have limited number of planes, and you can always choose when to bring them in, and they provide die roll modifiers. It's real simple that way. So if I'm the Germans, I'm like, yes, I'm going to bring in this one air unit. We'll pretend that the Russians don't have any to offer, and that it's a clear day. If it's cloudy or rainy, you have to add three to your roll, which makes it very difficult. And what I mean by that, of course, is the efficiency check. An airplane unit has this two numbers, one and seven. This is the die roll modifier if you get the airplane in action. This is the efficiency rating you have to roll to get it into action. So I'm going to try to put this plane into action. I'm going to roll this die and roll a six. So that means this plane has passed its efficiency check. And actually what it is, it's six plus one because I declared a mobile sequence. So what you do is you sort of roll that six. And if you look on your chart here, it actually comes with a very nice little player aid. It comes with you. We see there's all sorts of, um, here we go, there's all sorts of different modifiers you can get for attacking and doing whatnot. So if you see the cast column there, uh, we could have our command points being used to help it. We don't have those right here. But as you see, combat occurs in a mobile sequence plus one. Um, and we didn't have cloudy or rainy weather, and the defender text did not have woods. So we add plus one to our roll. It becomes a seven here. We got a six. Whoop, there it is. So it becomes a seven. That airplane passes. And we get what we call a die roll modifier of minus one for cast. Wait, make sure I write this where you can see it. So we get minus one for close air support. After that, we do artillery. The defender decides if they're going to allocate artillery first. In this case, there is no artillery to allocate except for the one over here. So we will use it just to show it off. What it does is that we roll, of course, a check. If you have a bunch of artillery, you just pick one unit and you have it assume for every unit, right? So this is a roll of six. We add one because, of course, it's a mobile combat. Wow. Got a five here, so five plus one is six. That means I would be able to get the full strength from this artillery unit in this combat, which is three. If I had not rolled, like if I had rolled an eight and it failed, I would only get half of this value rounded down. So it'd be one versus three. And if I rolled a 10, I get nothing. If it's modified to a 10, you get nothing. So you can totally whiff on artillery rolls. It's really awful and embarrassing when you do. Once you use an artillery, you flip it over to its fired side. 
and then the next turn it's flipped back over if it's in supply. So if we did this attack, suddenly our attack would become not just 21 to 9, but uh, 24 to 9. That's not enough to change the basic odds, but in some cases artillery can and will. And that's where you do that step. And then finally we would do what we call um, combat coordination. And if you're doing mobile combat and it says uh, if the attackers are not disrupted and in the same hex, you don't have to do one. So in this case, we're not disrupted and we're all in the same hex. We don't have to. But if for some reason I had, say, this arrangement going on, and I had two units attacking, well, now I'm attacking from more than one hex. I have to roll coordination for that. And there's modifiers you also add to that roll. Uh, if you pass it, nothing happens. If you don't pass it, then you get a plus two modifier to your final battle roll. So it's, it can be really nasty. Um, once again, the higher efficiency unit Germans uh, tend to pass those better than Russians, so they can actually pull those attacks off, usually with greater precision. But we don't have to do a coordination here because we're not disrupted and we're attacking from the same hex. So now we compute our total strength. In this case, it's still two to one odds. We pull in terrain modifiers. So here he's in a village in Doljitsi, so he gets a plus one modifier for hanging out there. So that negates kind of our cast bonus. We'll do like village, right? So our total bonuses are zero. I roll the final die. It's a seven. We then cross-reference that on the combat results table for a seven. And I can't really show it. Actually, I can't really show it. Let's take a look. So on two to one... Oops, sorry there. We can see if we roll a seven, then it's a defender retreat with a red result, which means armor attrition, which I discussed in the last video. We would check um, essentially for armor losses and plane losses and all that stuff. Like the plane I used here would actually get checked for a loss now. We'd have to roll and beat a seven to keep our plane. Um, but it's a good defender retreat. So what would happen in this combat example here is that this unit now will have to retreat um, two hexes because it was a mobile combat. If it was an assault combat, it's just one. If it's mobile, it's two. And then go any two hexes anywhere they want. So I'll just move them back up the road, right? And then as the attacker, you can advance after combat. And if it's mobile, you can go up to two, but not force two. So I'll just go one and maybe two again, right? To keep that going. That's a basic combat. You have sort of a few elements. You have the enemy reaction. They can do reaction, combat refusal, no retreat. You then decide on your close air support. You roll for that. You decide on artillery support. You roll for that. And then you check for a coordination check. Um, and that's pretty much how combat goes. It, it's really procedural, but once you get used to doing the procedure, it's not that difficult. And it actually becomes really fast. And there's a lot of times where you're like, ugh, I'm not using air. It's a cloudy turn. I'm just not going to be able to get my planes out. Or you just know right away that you have to do certain assault combats. You know the odds already. You've had that turn a couple times. So it seems like a lot of calculations at first, but you really do get used to it. And uh, there's a lot more to the battle system that I've just done this example. Obviously, assaults are a lot different. There can be lots of units reacting. Um, there can be more modifiers, things like that. But this is a good basic example. And um, so I think we've pretty much covered almost everything I want to look at before we just launch into the game. So I think the next video actually will set up the board and we'll discuss sort of pre-turn one strategies, what we wanna see from both sides, what sort of the plan is, and then hopefully get it started and do turn one. All right, that's great.